two minus the cutoff of C. <clears throat> so, um, let's see, so first passage for collision. Most many of you probably know what that is. Um, <clears throat> so, we have um, passage times attached to the edges of the lattice. And I'm only going to work in two dimensions here, so we're in the plane. Um, and the passage times are IID, non negative random variables. And um, then we can construct what you can think of as a random metric on the lattice um, by defining the passage time between any two lattice points, like the X and Y in the picture there, as being the minimum over all paths from X to Y of the sum of the passage times um, along that path. And I call them times, but for, um, for our purposes, it's really more natural to think of this as, as creating a, a, a metric, as I said, or it's a pseudo metric in general. Um, and, and then under mild conditions, you know, you, you, you theme them here over paths achieved, you're not going to go to a huge uh, long distance to go from X to Y. So it's effectively a you know, bounded number of paths, so that will be a minimizing one. And if, as long as your distribution of the passage times is continuous, then almost surely the, the uh, minimizer is. And so we call that the geodesic from X to Y. So that might be the path that, uh, that you see in the picture there. Um, and the, um, <clears throat> so we have this, this random metric that we get from, I can think of it as either times to get from X to Y or distances. Um, and if you want to understand the nature of that metric, one of the most important things is to understand the geodesics and their geometry. And one of the basic questions is whether the geodesics are disjoint or not. Because somehow when you rescale this system and try to look at um, what's called the directed landscape, which is the uh, conjecture uh, scaling limit of this thing, um, then the, the geodesics that are really sort of distinct from each other are the ones that are that are disjoint. So you can still see them as separate geodesics. And whatever. So um, <clears throat> we want to know, you know, what is the probability of that disjointness if I have some particular um, well, like in the picture, some spacing, some length L of the geodesics, and some spacing which might be different on the left and right, um, <clears throat> A and B between the endpoints. Um, I'll always take the A to be the smaller distance and put it on the left. Um, obviously, it's symmetric there. Now, uh, so that's, that's the basic setup and the question that we want to ask. Well, how does that probability behave as a function of A, B, and L? Now, one thing that's relevant to this is the so-called transverse wandering exponent, um, which we don't know. Uh, first passage percolation has the issue that a lot of very basic properties that are believed to be true are not proved, uh, very difficult to prove. Um, and one of those is the existence of the exponent I'm about to mention. Uh, so there should be an exponent xi such that when you look at the geodesic of length n, that typically it wanders from the straight line by a border n to the xi. Now, uh, for uh, directed last passage percolation, which is a variant in which uh, you maximize rather than minimize the sum along the path. Um, if you have certain distributions for the passage time, then this becomes an integrable, solvable model, and you can get a lot of information, a lot of formulas. And uh, for, for that and other reasons, we believe that this wandering exponent is two thirds. Um, so what you would expect then is that the disjointness uh, like at the upper left there is uh, likely when the A and B are separated by less, by, by more than L, uh, L to the two thirds, the A and B are bigger than L to the two thirds and, and uh, not so likely if they're less than that. So that, that's what we it ought to be true because if the geodesics are, are able to wander far enough from straight lines that they can um, join together, like on the right, then, then they're likely to do so. There's some, there's some one best path sort of from, one end to the other, and they're both going to take that. They just have to you know, join it at different points. Um, <clears throat> now, there's a closely related problem that's been looked at for um, yet another model that I won't describe in detail, but it's a sort of variant of, I believe, last passage percolation called Brownian last passage percolation, um, which is also an integral model. Um, if you take two uh, short the, vert the vertical uh, intervals at the end of length uh, of order L to the two thirds, a small multiple L to the two thirds, 
So we expect that typically, if, because it's a small multiple of L to the two thirds, that um, there's the geodesics between those two ends should all join together. They shouldn't be disjoint, but they, they can be. And in fact, you could in principle have multiple disjoint geodesics like that. So you can ask what's the probability that there are K of them, disjoint geodesics connecting this interval together. And uh, Hammond showed that that goes like um, epsilon to the K squared minus one over two. Um, but this involves um, algebraic um, methods coming into play as is the case for uh, you know, these integrable models. Um, like, and you use things like the RSK correspondence from combinatorics, um, and they don't really give you any kind of geometric or probabilistic intuition as to why that's the correct exponent. It's just something that you know, comes out of the parallels between the two models. Um, but anyway, this is a central result to a sequence of papers that uh, Hammond did about the Brownian last passage percolation. So our context is kind of similar to k equals two. It's not exactly the same question, but pretty close. So if you take um, our a and b to be of order l to the two thirds, and let's say a equals b to keep it simple, um, then it's, it suggests that the probability of disjointness should go like a to the two thirds over l. If you just use, um, oh, sorry, a to the three halves over l, because if you take k equals two up in the uh, formula in the fourth line there, that's what you get. Um, so, so, can, so, sorry. so this is not a lattice anymore. Uh, no, um, it's the Brownian is, is a, um, I mean, it's not really naturally on a lattice, uh, the Brownian last passage percolation. Um, so, but it doesn't really tell us, you know, why should this be three half? Where does that exponent come from? And also what happens if your A and B are different or if they're much smaller than uh, order L to the two thirds, then what, what happens here? But still it's, uh, it's uh, information for making uh, guesses about the right answer. Now there's another so-called KPZ exponent. Um, this being a system that's believed to be in the KPZ universality class um, that the, if you look at the fluctuation standard deviation of the passage time, it grows like a certain power of X and chi power of X and this chi is believed to be one third. But again, no proof except for the uh, last passage uh, solvable cases. So you can really, there's two different ways you could define this exponent chi, they're called chi minus and chi plus. Um, one is to just say, okay, what, what power does the variance grow like? So that would be this limit of ratio of uh, logs. Let's call that chi minus. And then chi plus, you could look at, okay, let's look at it at the exponential level. Um, if the fluctuations are of order n to the chi, then that exponent um, should be something of order one. Um, and so it should stay bounded in N. Uh, so we can say, okay, what is the infimum of those chi's for which that is true? And that's really sort of another way of measuring what the fluctuation size is. So because we don't have any proof that chi even exists, we have to make a hypothesis here to prove things that there is actually a well-defined fluctuation exponent, which more precisely means that these chi plus and minus are the same thing. So that's an, an assumption that you know, we'd like to have proof of it, but we don't have. It seems that the second one is very is, is stronger because in the first one there is variance. Yes, so right. The, the, that's moments, why it's plus. It's going to be the if, exponential moment. If they're different, yeah, then the chi plus would be the bigger one. But we expect they should be the same. You should both just describe uh, the fluctuations. So, I mean, how how do we know that chi plus is? It's, it's a stupid, probably question, but how do we know that chi plus is finite? Um, well, we what yeah right. We, we do don't we don't know that a priori. If the uh, uh, if the uh, passage times have an exponential moment, and so I think you can verify that the, the chi plus would be fine. In fact, we do know that. Uh, uh, so why would if, it if they have an exponential, exponential moment, 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 then we know that the, the uh, chi plus is at most a half. No, no, no. I mean, why would it have exponential moment to begin with? Um, well, if the individual passage times have an exponential moment, then so will the, the t0, any one. And the, the and individual times, why would they? Because sorry. like something should be bounded in the end. Um, probably. Well, not, I mean, the exponential moment is enough. You don't need to have actual boundedness of the passage time. Variable. I mean, so in the end, you, in the beginning, you, you, you just assume that this passage Yeah, I mean, time it should have an exponential moment. That's going to be that's something. And then, then no problem. Yeah. Okay, 
Um, I'd just say a few words about the norm and the limit shape that you have in first passage percolation. The so-called wet region is the, if you think of these as times rather than distances, um, the points that can be reached in time t, this random time, uh, that, that is the minimum over paths. Um, and then if you take those points and expand each one to be a square instead of just a point, so you get like a solid object, then that's called the wet region. And um, now, if you look at the passage time in a particular direction, uh, x, so you look at multiples of x, 0 to nx, and then divide by n, so you're getting sort of a rate uh, in, in the direction n, uh, how, how long it takes uh, per, you, per distance x. Asymptotically, we call that g of x. And it's not hard to check that g of x is a norm. And um, it, so it has some unit ball, and that's called the limit shape. And uh, there are standard theorems uh, telling you that uh, under mild conditions that the wet region converges. And, and if I could be rescale that it converges to this uh, limit shape. Um, and it's all be, always been convex. It's the unit ball of the norm. Um, now, it, it is, it's possible to create situations, there's a paper of Durrett and Liggett from 1981, where um, the limit shape has uh, facets on the sides, or it has uh, flat, flat pieces on the sides. Um, but uh, it's believed that that only happens if you have a sort of uh, percolation of uh, maximally fast edges, like if the minimum uh, passage time possible is one, and one has a, a large enough probability that you have a whole lot, you know, of infinite paths of just ones, then that's when you end up with these, these facets. But otherwise, it's believed that the, that the limit shape should be, um, uh, should not have any facets or corners. It should be just some, um, you know, uh, strictly convex uh, uh, shape uh, with curvature. But curvature isn't, hasn't been proved for any, in any particular example. Again, this is an unproven thing. I'm just referring to a belief here. So some people have proved theorems on the assumption that this limit shape has a, 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 has a curvature. Now the, the uh, curvature is, yeah. Is, it, is, is the limit shape low or do you have exponential wave functions? Um, the, the limit shape is not uh, known in any, in any concrete example. No, you can't like write out what it is, except I guess in the, uh, um, in the last passage case, then, then you can. But not for first passage, it's not mm -hmm. solvable. Now, the significance of this curvature is that it controls how strict the triangle inequality is for the norm G. Um, if you have a curvature in a direction and you look at sort of, uh, say in the, the picture here, going from zero to X, and you say, what if I deviate from that straight line, whether geodesic or whatever, and go visit this point V along the way? So how much extra distance am I going? Well, if the V is distance L from the line, then it's order L squared over norm X. Um, so the idea here is that if your uh, variance um, for distance X, let's say that distance is called R. So there's some um, sigma of R that, that gives you the standard, approximately the standard deviation, um, then for the geodesic to go past through V, we, we see this little extra distance between U and V, and then another one on the other side of V, uh, that the geodesic has to go to pass through V rather than just go along the straight line. And it has to have the fluctuations have to be big enough in the passage time so that um, it might be faster to go through V than um, to just stay close to the straight line. So if there's a fluctuation, um, the passage time is faster than its mean, or faster than this sort of asymptotic approximation G, um, then it may be worth going through V. And the, the how much faster does it need to be? Well, it has to compensate for that extra distance of order L squared over X. So if you, you know, turn that into, uh, you know, what does that tell you? It says that the transverse fluctuation should be of the order of this delta of R that you see, um, right there, that delta of R um, <clears throat> of order R times sigma of R to the one half. And that grows like uh, R to the psi, so the psi is one plus chi over two. So that tells you that your, your psi should be one plus chi over two. That's not a proof. The proof is in the paper of Chatterjee about 10 years ago of that relation between the, the um, fluctuation exponent and the wandering exponent. 
the, the key thing to remember here is this delta of R that describes a typical transverse wandering, um, assuming that the fluctuations are like sigma four. Um, okay. So now back to the question of disjointness. Here's something to give a hint of the answer. Um, so you can think of uh, geodesics from the origin, and they go out to some uh, distance of uh, this capital L, roughly, um, which is the length of geodesics that we're interested in. And we get a whole tree of them, geodesics, going out to all the points on that <coughs> Uh, boundary on the right. Um, they, they're necessarily a tree because geodesics are unique. Um, so we can ask, okay, how many geodesics are there crossing a circle along the way? Let's say at some radius r. Um, the, the, the crossing points where there are geodesics to the, the far boundary crossing a smaller circle um, should be spaced apart heuristically by a border of delta of r because that's how, how much geodesics can sort of wander in order to join together and when they when they can join together they usually will so they should their, their spacing should correspond to the, the this transverse wandering that i talked about um, so that's uh, let's think of that as like the natural spacing at radius r so what happens is um, you can look out there at the boundary on the right um, at which points are reached through a given crossing point um, at, at this radius r here at the uh, uh, smaller radius, and those divide the boundary into little arcs where the points all came through the same um, crossing point along the way. So, uh, where is my... Okay, yeah, so, so here, um, I've made these little marks and, and then there are, so you have these arcs where everybody there, the geodesic came through the same point here. Um, and then you have this arc over here. Um, and then there are these, you can think of them as gaps in between these arcs that separate the, inter, the, the arcs or intervals where they use the same crossing point along the way. Um, so what is the spacing typically of these uh, gaps between the arcs? Well, um, we know what the spacing is at the inner radius. You just kind of project that out to the outer one. And it says that you get um, what I wrote in um, red over here. The spacing um, between the gaps should look like that. If indeed the spacing at the inner one is of order of delta of R, like it should be. So if we fix some, uh, I, I want to fix this separation A and then choose the, the, the radius R, the inner one, to be delta inverse of A so that the natural spacing then will be A at that um, inner arc there. So uh, <clears throat> if I uh, look at an arc of length B here on the right, I can ask, what's the probability that there's one of those gaps that lies in there? Well, the density of them is this uh, one that I underlined in green over here. And so I just multiply that by E, it would, it would give me uh, something like the probability that there is an arc inside that interval. It's all heuristics uh, so far. So um, we can formulate a question that's, again, slightly different from the one we really want. We can ask, okay, if I pick two points over here on the right, P and Q, that are separated by B, I want to know about them staying disjoint, joining two points that are separated by A. Um, so I'm modifying and saying, okay, what's the probability that when I take the geodesics from P and Q to the origin, that they cross at different points here? So they're still disjoint when they get when they get into the inner circle here. And that's the same thing as asking what's the probability that one of these gaps lies between P and Q, which is what you know we, we do. Uh, got a heuristic for over here. Um, so um, that tells us then what the probability, you know, we can kind of guess what the probability is for, for the modified situation we just described, that the probability of these uh, paths being disjoint from P and Q, at least as far as this inner circle before they come together, will look like this uh, ratio here. Um, 
So that would be if I if I write that in terms of exponents, that's going to look like a to the one minus one over i minus one times e over l. Now we can look at how this compares to um, what Hammond said about his situation. So you take a equals b, and uh, in this context, we know that xi is two thirds. Um, then it does agree with what his forecast, what what his uh, theorem um, said. So maybe that's a, a suggestion that this, even though this is a different problem, really, that maybe this is telling us at least what the right answer would ought to, ought to be, the one that's circled um, near the bottom of the page there. Um, okay. Anybody, uh, oops. Yeah. Anybody want to ask questions at this point? I'm going to modify the, the context a little bit. Instead of the integer lattice, um, in order that we, one way to ensure that the boundary uh, has curvature is to work in an isotropic context where this limit shape in the theorem has to be just the bulk, Euclidean bulk. So that's what I want to do uh, to change the graph to a particular kind of random graph, not a very general one. I just want one that will work. I want it to be very lattice like. So I construct a random graph in the plane as lattice-like as possible. And so these are some of the properties that would make it lattice-like. First of all, it should be uh, stationary, ergodic, isotropic. Um, I want a bounded size for, for sort of holes here, points that don't have any vertices. So I want, let's say, every unit ball um, to have at least one vertex in it. So that means you can't use like a Poisson process for vertices, that wouldn't work. And I also want a finite range of dependence. I want to know that if I have two regions that are separated by at least rho for some distance rho, um, then the restrictions of the graph to those, uh, those two subsets are going to be independent of each other. It's not clear that those last two things are even compatible, but it turns out they are, fortunately. Also, bounded dilation, which means that the length of paths in this graph, if I compare that, the length of the shortest path in this graph, just you know, the Euclidean length of all the edges, and compare that to the Euclidean separation of the endpoints, I want the one to be bounded relative to the other. That's called the dilation. So I want bounded dilation. And also, I don't want the points to be too dense. So I want to say the probability that n, n, n vertices inside a bounded region, say a unit ball, decays exponentially in n. So there is such a graph that's you know, a different uh, theorem, not too, not too difficult construct such a thing. Um, if, you, if you make your graph uh, what's called the Delaunay triangulation, don't worry if you don't know what that is, then it's automatically true that it has bounded dilation uh, to that effect that I cited there. Um, yeah. Maybe I don't know the terminology, but I know what is triangulation for a set of, let's say, discrete set, right? Yeah. So what is the base, like, how do you view, like, it's, 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 it's donor triangulation of what Okay, so you make the, yeah, the, you have the, some point process, and then you make, um, you know, the, the Voronoi cells, yes. and then they connect the, the, the ones that are adjacent um, with edges. If, if two points have adjacent Voronoi cells, then you connect those with an edge, and that's your Delaunay triangulation. But what about the distance? Like, well, how do you enforce the property that every ball contains a point? Every oh, ball. yeah, when you construct a point process, you have to make it that way. So it's the way you can construct a point process so that that's true. And then you make the Delaunay triangulation from that. So you first make the vertices and then say, okay, the vertices have the necessary properties. And so I make the Delaunay triangulation. So we have this lemma that says that, yes, okay, you can do that. Um, and we build, the, build it from like a space-time Poisson process. So you can think of it as like there are points popping up in time, various times in, in, in the plane. And we sort of decide which points will keep to be vertices as, as it goes, and then we get it that way. And one, uh, that's a sort of a technical point that because um, we do that, it enables us to use things like the Vandenberg test and Reimer inequality, which again, if you're not familiar, don't worry what that is. Um, <clears throat> because it's constructed from something that's completely sort of fully independent. Um, it's a Poisson process in space time. Um, you have to be careful that when you have this, um, uh, some arguments, you know, in first pass percolation, use the FKG property. Now it's only going to be valid if you condition on the graph. So that causes some technical issues, but you won't see those here. 
All right, so here's a the theorem. Um, so our core assumptions are we, we use a, a random graph that's sort of lattice-like. <coughs> Um, we oh I guess I didn't say it here. Uh, another thing we do to um, make the thing a little bit more like a lattice is that instead of uh, IID times on these edges, we use IID speeds. So the passage time along an edge is IID speed multiplied by the length of the edge, and then we're, then we're minimizing you know using those to make geodesics and so on. So. Uh, <clears throat> We're assuming the speed is a continuous random variable, so there won't be ties. And geodesics are unique. You should have a finite exponential moment for the reasons I talked about before. And we have to assume that these two definitions of the fluctuation exponent are the same. And if they're not, um, zero. So under those assumptions, there's uh, sub polynomial functions, which means growing or shrinking slower than any power, um, such that the, the you know, theorem, the, Formula we discussed before is correct to within these subpolynomial factors. So this phi of a is something subpolynomial, and then we have this uh, a to the one over i minus one times b over l as describing the probability of disjointness. And again, a and b are the separations at the ends, and xi is this wandering exponent. Um, so if xi is in, presuming xi is indeed two thirds, then that power of a is, is uh, three halves. Psi is something. I'm sorry, like, uh, three halves minus one, so one half. Sorry, is psi something like uh, log of a to some power, something like that? I'm sorry, is it what? Is it like log of a to some power? Uh, well, we don't. You can't really say. You know, we have these two definitions of the chi plus and the chi minus, okay. and the corresponding functions that go with those, which both grow like the right. same power, right. and we don't know. So there's some ratio between those, which is subpolynomial, and you don't know what it is. Right. Just, uh, yeah. So you can't say higher order expansion of those things, not just uh, the limit. Of those right. It's, it's it's specified in terms of like the difference between those two okay. versions of chi, and uh, you know. So yeah. So the probability of the event you wrote here depends on both the graph and the weights. Sorry. It depends on what? Both the graph and the weights. Um. Yes, right. I mean, uh, so it's a probability yeah, as a function of the graph and the weights. Yeah, right. Okay. So a, a major um, proof ingredient in this is controlling. Um, I talked about these, these crossing points along the way to the boundary. You have to have bounds for how many of those there are. I gave the heuristic that, you know, you expect them to be sort of separated by this distance delta of R that's the that corresponds to the transverse wandering. But we need something more um, rigorous than that. Um, so let's think about um, sort of a simplified version without curves, where we're looking at geodesics that go between uh, two lines at, at zero and R. And then we ask how many points are there where uh, one of these geodesics crosses uh, at some intermediate distance S. And um, so the with the lemma, so what we want to show here in the lemma um, is that uh, if indeed there are some number which I'll call n cubed of these geodesics from one end to the other, then you can find within them a, a subcollection of the geodesics um, on, on one side or the other of s, either 0 to s or s to r, you can find n of them which are disjoint. Um, disjoint on that side of, of S. Um, so this is really sort of a combinatorial fact, it turns out. Um, first of all, to see why this is true, um, one thing to point out is that you have, if you have two geodesics that cross S at different points, then they cannot touch each other on both sides of S, because otherwise you'd have a non-unique geodesic between a point on the left and a point on the right of S. So, um, they, can, they can touch on the left, they can touch on the right, but, but they can't touch uh, both places. So what that means is if I have, one, one way to get this disjointness is if I have what I call a popular site on, let's say, the left side of S that has n geodesics passing through it, if they all have different crossing points at S, then none of those are allowed to touch each other on the right, so then I have disjointness of those geodesics from S to R. So if I have this popular site, that's one thing that would give me um, n geodesics disjoint on one side. 
So the, the idea here is that if I if I order the geodesics um, in my collection um, from top to bottom by their starting by where their starting point is, and I break ties by using where they cross S. So like here, the um, the red ones would be the first, and then the uh, blue ones, and then that then the green ones could be a red, blue, and green over here on the left. Um, and so I guess some kind of I've, I've let's say I have n cube different crossing points here. So I guess some kind of uh, so I really have n cube geodesics. Some some of them you know start together, don't separate until along the way. Um, and uh, so that gives me a permutation of one to n cubed by start, by saying okay, there's some ordering on the left here and some other ordering on the right over there. They get permuted. If I have an increasing subsequence of that uh, permutation. It's a set of geodesics like in the middle picture here with the red ones, where they're uh, they can touch each other but they don't cross. Um, that's increasing subsequence. There's no kind of changing of the ordering, so they don't cross each other. They can just touch. Um, <clears throat> and when I have geodesics that don't cross like that, um, if I, if I have um, where their kind of ordering is separated by at least n, um, if all of those, like let's say n equals three, so I could say, okay, these top three ones here, if they all touch each other at some point x, then that's one of these popular sites and they have to be disjoint over on uh, once they get past s there because they have different crossing points. Um, if there's no popular site, then what I can do is um, if I take every nth geodesic on the left, then they're necessarily um, disjoint. And so then I can get um, in disjoint geodesics on the left that way. Um, now, if I had a, a, a decreasing subsequence, um, then that means that all of the geodesics are crossing each other. They're completely in opposite order on the right from what they were on the left. So they all cross each other. Um, so that means that those geodesics have to be disjoint to the right because they've all touched each other on the left, the left of S. So once they get over in this part you can't see, um, they have to be uh, disjoint. So if we have a decreasing subsequence, it gives disjointness on the right. Now there's the uh, Erdős, how do you pronounce it? Shekerish? Right? Yeah. Erdős Shekerish theorem. It says that if you have um, uh, a, well in this case, a uh, permutation of n cubed elements, then you either have an increasing subsequence of n squared of them or decreasing of n, and either way you get your disjoint geodesic. Now that doesn't finish what we want. What we, um, what we want to do is show it's unlikely for this to happen. So now we have to show that n disjoint geodesics is unlikely. I'm not gonna um, go through the, um, the, uh, the full argument of that, um, but basically once they're disjoint, you, you can't quite yet use the Vandenberg test in inequality, but you're a lot closer to it. Um, and uh, I'll just, Leave it at that because I don't want to go into explaining what the inequality says and all that. I just want to give an idea of how we know that there are these disjoint geodesics, and that tells us that it's unlikely that you have too many different crossing points um, for geodesics along the way, because otherwise you would get these disjoint ones. If you have n cube different crossing points, you get these n disjoint geodesics, and then you can show that's unlikely. Okay, so now I want to go to the ideas of, of, of some ideas of how we prove the uh, disjointness uh, result, what's the probability of disjointness. So you probably, you know, you know what disjoint means? It means they don't touch. At least that's what you think it means. And I guess the first thing I need to do is kind of re-educate you about that. So here's what disjoint really means, really in quotes. So you have these geodesics, x to p and y to q. They're disjoint if you take the diagonal geodesic, let's say from x to q, um, it's gonna have points where there's a bifurcation, like here at this y, um, rightward bifurcation between p and q from x occurs there. And then there's this leftward bifurcation from q going to x and y for those geodesics. And disjointness just says that along the diagonal geodesic, you get the rightward bifurcation before the leftward one as you go from left to right. So the rightward bifurcation point precedes the leftward one, if and only if they're disjoint. 
Now, so what I want to do is um, subdivide the, um, the event of disjointness according to the scales of where these bifurcation points are. So I make scales in the following way. Um, the X and Y are separated by A. And I want to make my scales based on this uh, sort of radius that corresponds to a separation of A. So that's just this delta inverse of A. At radius RA, the typical separation of the geodesics, the wandering of the geodesics is of order A. So I think of having a, um, putting an origin over here at distance um, RA. It should be like way more over to the left, but you know, picture's compressed. Um, and then I, my, my scales are this, uh, at scale RA, there's the points X and Y, and then I have powers of two, two, four, eight, RA, and so on. <clears throat> Um, so that gives me first, second, third uh, scale, and so on. And because the rightward one precedes the leftward one, um, if the, like in this picture, the rightward one is on the second scale and the leftward one is on the third scale, uh, so if I call those scales J and K, then it has to be J less or equal K. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to look at all the possible. J and K, so I'm going to sort of one at a time, see what happens. So that each one can occur on, on any scale as long as J is less than equal to. So let's look first um, at the rightward bifurcation. So we had this idea of the tree of geodesics. Um, so there's some, at, at, if you look at the scales that define the um, so the rightward one is occurring on the j scale. So you look at the uh, radii that define that, two to the j minus one RA and two to the j RA. And then inside there, there has to be this, this bifurcation, which means that they, the, the geodesics from X to P and Q, they share a common crossing point um, here. Let me get there. And I take this, they have a common crossing point there uh, and two different crossing points here, B and W. Um, <clears throat> So um, we can look at the crossing points. We can make uh, what I'll call annular sectors, just intersection of an annulus with a sector. Uh, so that sort of um, megaphone shape thing there. Um, and make it um, sort of a little, a little extra wide compared to the typical sort of transverse wandering at that scale. Like I this uh, with this here, with this extra power blog, just to make sure that the, to make sure that the geodesics are very likely to actually pass through that little megaphone thing, annular sector. Um, and then um, if we look at the uh, set of, of crossing points um, here and then also here, um, then if I, fix a, if I fix a crossing point like you over here on the left, and I think of the tree of geodesics coming from you, then the number of uh, sort of gaps I get over here between the, the arcs corresponding to the different um, crossing points um, here, um, those, the, the number of those is bounded by the number of crossing points that I have um, in the annular sector, in the outer part of the annular sector. So I get one of these gaps over here. For, so for a fixed U, thinking of that as a root, I get these, these gaps over here. And one of those gaps has to lie between E and Q in order to get this, this disjointness. Um, to get the bifurcation to occur there means that uh, one of those gaps is going to lie there. And there's not that many possible gaps because um, what that um, lemma enables us to do is to say that with very high probability, the number of crossing points inside either of these green circles here at either of those radii is bounded by some subpolynomial function of, of the radius two to the JRA. So like a log or whatever it might be, we don't know. Um, so uh, that's, that's, yeah, that's from our um, lemma about bounding the number of crossing points. So that's what should make it unlikely in a sense that we have um, this bifurcation point on, on scale J. I guess you should think of the situation where the bifurcations occur kind of more toward the left side and you have to look separately at what happens if they're more toward the right side or in the middle or one at each end or whatever. Uh, but let's just think of them both as being you know, closer to X and Y than to P and Q. Um, so 
that, that the number of possible gaps, if we look at all the possible crossing points inside the annular sector, there aren't that many. So that, that should help us control the probability that there is one that lies between P and Q. Uh, even if we allow the, the, even if we take the union over all these different routes U. So each route U will give us a different set of gaps and, and, and arcs over there on the right. Even if we take the union over U, there aren't that many U's uh, crossing points. So there still shouldn't be too many. Um, and so that's kind of the idea. And then a similar picture for the leftward bifurcations. Um, for it, it turns out to be technically convenient to look at the um, instead of an arc on the left side, we'll just use a vertical line. So you can, but you can do basically the same thing. You look, you, you have these intervals in the vertical line where the geodesics. Um, reach it from um, this crossing point u prime over here. Um, let's see. Prime. Um, and so we have the geodesics going left from there, and then they're crossing at different points at the, uh, at the left end of the uh, annular sector. And then they're making these gaps and intervals in the vertical line. Um, so again, it should be, we have to have one of those gaps lie between X and Y if we're gonna get um, the bifurcation to occur there. Now we're on uh, the K scale for where the location of this uh, annular sector is. Um, <clears throat> and that should make it sort of unlikely that, uh, that we have a, a gap. There aren't that many possible gaps again because there are not that many different possible crossing points. It's U prime, V prime, W prime. You see in this picture, each, U, each different U prime gives us a different set of gaps, but even if we combine them all together again, there's not that many. So, so how unlikely, I just said it should be unlikely. How unlikely should it be? Well, um, if we look at this, this annular sector and kind of project it out to the, to the, the boundary at, at the right over here, then, um, the, the length of it, when you project it out to scale L, becomes this uh, um, <clears throat> big fraction there to the right of the picture. Um, so that means that the, um, the, the density of arc gaps, at least with high probability, these, these gaps that I talked about before that are represented by these three arrows here, um, you should sort of just pay attention to the parts that I wrote in blue here. Um, the others are just some kind of sub polynomial factors that uh, come in here. The, the number of crossing points um, at the inner radius and the outer radius of the sector. And then this is the um, uh, the, um, yeah, the, the, this is the, num the number of gaps that there are. And then we're basically dividing by this length of the arc over on the right. And that's giving us the density uh, with high probability it's bounded by that. So we expect that the uh, um, probability then of there being one between P and Q, which is a length B, we just take the density and multiply it by B. So basically that gives us something like this, uh, the, the blue fraction down there at the lower right um, with some, some polynomial correction to it. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's when the, that's for the rightward one only now, um, when it occurs on the J scale, you see the J and the exponent there due to the J times one minus one. Um, <clears throat> again, this is, you know, it's, it's hand wavy. I'll describe how you make it rigorous without actually going through, which is, you know, obviously gonna be quite technical. Um, <clears throat> so the leftward one is kind of similar. Um, it's a little, a little bit different because the, uh, the leftward bifurcation is occurring, um, we, I, I said, think of it as a situation where the leftward bifurcation occurs kind of way over to the left side. Um, so it, you get a different looking formula. It's really just, it turns out to be that the uh, probability of a gap looks like one over two to the k psi, where again, psi is this wandering exponent. Now, more hand waviness, if indeed, if these two uh, leftward and rightward events of the, the, the bifurcations and having the gaps lie in the, in the intervals where they need to, if those are independent, then we can just multiply these two probabilities and say the probability is that we have both of these gaps um, at both ends, like uh, 
in this picture here, that we have both a gap over here between X and Y for the, uh, for the leftward geodesics and a, a gap between P and Q for the rightward geodesics uh, would be the product. Um, so then you get, if you multiply them, you get this uh, the formula on the right um, in the middle there. Um, this formula basically with some some polynomial um, correction to it. And then you can sum that over J and K using the fact that the wandering exponent Xi is always at least a half of the formula that we had, it's strictly bigger than a half when the chi is positive. Um, so you can sum that over J and K. And what you get then is that the probability of disjointness, um, <clears throat> the, the really J and K being zero, that's the term that, that dominates. So you do end up with uh, what we want here. Um, now you have to tweak this sum to deal with the other situations where the bifurcations are not sort of over toward the left side, they occur somewhere else in the system, but that's the, uh, the basic idea of um, what happens. Um, so that suggests that the bifurcations are uh, most likely to occur, to actually be over way toward the left side, because those, those terms, J and K being one, that sort of gives the dominant uh, probability um, when we look at as a function of J and K. It's just, a, it's just an upper bound, but uh, uh, still that's suggested. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, so what, how do we make this idea rigorous, especially this idea of the, of the independence? Well, you know, where, where did that come from? We do is to, I mean, somehow we're using the idea that um, there's some density of these arc gaps in the vertical line on the left and the arc on the right. And so that density is supposed to correspond to a probability of being in a particular interval. So there's some kind of um, uh, saying that some kind of things are, we're using implicitly there some kind of rotational invariance. And that's why we need the system to be rotationally invariant, isotropic, um, so that we can make a, a rigorous argument out of that. What we're going to do is average over different rotations. So we have the x, y, and p, q, and then think of the horizontal axis between them. We rotate that axis to get axis together with the p and q by some ang small angle theta. So we get points x of theta and y of theta on the left, and p of theta, q of theta on the right, still on the, the, the same um, it's the same circle over there on the right. We didn't change that. And you can ask the same question there. You know, what's the probability that geodesics are disjoint? Um, and we can just focus on a particular particular scales J and K for the bifurcation points. And say, okay, if we look at this system and we rotate the theta, so we're sort of rotating our window where we look, the X and X, Y, P, Q, and say, okay, what fraction of the time, what fraction of thetas give you um, a gap in there. And then if we take the expected value of that, that's the same as the probability because of the uh, isotropic nature of the thing. Um, so that helps us, that only helps us control things on the right side um, where we're, we're rotating and we're looking at different parts of the arc over here on, on the right as to whether there's a gap in there. Um, we, and then, when we rotate, then it, it changes where this um, angular sector is located. So we have a different set of crossing points when we rotate it, uh, changes the set of crossing points. And um, so one thing that helps manage that is we, uh, uh, we sort of discretize where that angular sector is located. We don't move it sort of continuously as we uh, change the angle theta. We change, bump it in little steps so that uh, we have a, just a, a finite number of these locations of the um, uh, annular sector there uh, that, that we need to look at. And you can count then the, uh, uh, the number of crossing points in each one and say that out of all of these um, annular sectors, there's probably none of them that have a very large number of crossing points um, of geodesics. Uh, we're trying to keep control of that number of crossing points. So what about on the left? We need to simultaneously deal with the left and the right. Um, <clears throat> so, oops. Let's see. 
Yeah, so what we do is average over also vertical translations. Um, there's a slight edge here that um, this x of theta and y of theta, when we rotate, they don't lie in the same vertical line anymore. So what we do is replace them with some points um, a little bit a little bit more widely spaced, maybe twice as far apart, uh, which are on, on this vertical line. Um, we're only doing rotations by small angles. So, um, and then use the fact that if the geodesics are disjoint from x of theta and y of theta going to p and q of theta over here, then with very high probability, they're also disjoint from this x star and y star. So you can use points on the vertical line. It's, just, it's a technical point there that we need to do that. So except for events you can show are low probability, again, if, if you have disjointness of the red one, then you also have disjointness from this x star and y star. The only way that wouldn't happen is if like the geodesic from x star wrapped around the back and came over to the right side or something in some weird way. So very, just very unlikely. So um, now, we, now we have both rotations and these uh, vertical translations. We also discretize the locations of the angular sector when we do the, the vertical shapes as well. Um, and let's see, what did I have here? So the full averaging looks like this. Um, we look at, uh, depending on the scale k, we have a certain range of, of vertical translations, plus or minus this sk, um, which looks like the, the um, typical wandering of a geodesic on that scale with an extra log factor. Um, and then there's a, a, a certain maximum angle that we, that we look at, which corresponds to the, um, the angle when you look, sort of look from the origin at radius, this radius uh, delta inverse A at a um, interval of length A. And then what is the angle of that? And then that's the range of angles that you look at. Um, so uh, we, we, again, fix um, a, a J and K, the scales of these bifurcations, and ask what's the probability that we have the bifurcations on those scales and we have this joint S. And then you can express that as this, using this average over the different rotations theta and vertical translations S of the event. And so you have the, the rotated and translated event here, which has the same probability, no matter what rotation and translation you use. Um, and uh, then you, you, know, you have sum over the different scales. Um, <clears throat> and when you do that, you, you see that just deterministically, uh, if there's not too many crossing points, you can bound this, the, the integral here, uh, this generated integral that we're taking the expected value of, because it's really just asking out of all these rotations and translations, how many of them put gaps um, in the right place inside the interval between X and Y on the left and between the P and Q on the right. And uh, that, that's the fraction of them that do. And it's, it's controlled when you have control of the number of crossing points of the geodesics inside these little annular sectors in the way that, that I described. So you just take the expected value of that controlled average, and then you get, you know, uh, a bound for that, um, and that bounds your probability. So I'm really just talking about the upper bound so far. Um, that bounds your probability of disjointness. Um, the lower bound kind of works in a similar way. You're still using uh, averaging, um, and in, in, I'll just say in a, in a somewhat similar way, you can get a, a lower bound. It's just you get uh, the um, sort of dividing by this subpolynomial function instead of multiplying by it. A small subpolynomial factor instead of a big one, basically. Um, let's see. I'm glossing over some things here. Um, what I call aberrations. I you know this is possible that some of uh, some of the things that I sort of assumed about the geometry of the situation that, that are unlikely to be violated, nonetheless, are. That's what I think of as aberrations, um, where geodesic is uh, too far from a straight line, like maybe it avoids this uh, annular sector that I wanted to pass through, or it backtracks and, and messes things up about like the J less than or equal to K. Um, or there are geodesics, if I, um, if I look at the way they meet the boundary here, there's some geodesics to the origin that might sort of go around the gap, like this little red loop that, that you see there. 
So there's a lot of little things like that that you got to worry about um, that, that mess things up technically that call aberration. So you have to deal with those. Um, and what you end up with is you say, okay, if there's aberrations, um, there's some scale on which they occur, some larger scale on which they occur. And they could, that could be either at the left end or the right end. And it, so there's aberrations like on the left end here out to some scale to the N, N scale, and then maybe the M scale over here. In between, there aren't aberrations. So in that situation, then you have disjoint geodesics between um, different points, the, between those two scales uh, where, where, where there are problems at the two ends. In between, then it's all nice and clean and you can apply what I just did. And then the aberrations are unlikely. So combine that to say that, um, you know, the, the bound that you have when things are nice also applies when things are not nice because the control is input. Um, I'll finish here with one last comment about an open problem. Um, what if, so we provided here a, uh, a you know, heuristic and a proof relay that goes with the Hammond's problem uh, when k equals two. But for k equals three, it's not even clear, you know, what is the heuristic in terms of, you know, you know is there something to do with like bifurcation points and so on that would tell you that you ought to get that formula with the k squared minus one over two. And it doesn't look like there is because if you have k geodesics, then um, the bifurcation points between adjacent ones, there's just, there's just two k minus one of those, two k minus two of those, um, whereas the exponent is like k squared. So there's, you know, it's hard to see how you would get kind of a geometric picture giving rise to uh, this, this kind of a formula for the probability of having K disjoint geodesics instead of two. So is there some way that uh, other than, you know, using the kind of combinatorial um, parallels like the RSK correspondence, uh, some kind of really just geometric way um, that you can see where that, that formula comes from for general k beyond k equals two. I'm stumped on that one. Solving that one for, for you guys to solve. And uh, 